me, I think that the problem is, and maybe this is kind of an answer to the question I had earlier, is that... Well, on that note, uh, questions from the audience. Okay, so one thing I struggle with, uh, so you hold that morality is basically what God says, right? Right. Or, yeah, yeah, God, yeah, God determines the good, the moral. So should faith be a sufficient defense for uh, criminals, mass murders perhaps, and uh, along the same lines, is jihad perpetuated in the name of wholehearted faith? Is that justified? I would say that I think that to us and to observers or people on the outside, I don't think that we should take that as a um, reasonable defense for it because if we said that, then that's a very dangerous precedent. Obviously, I mean, you can you can guess why. Like anyone could then do anything and say they did it in the name of faith. So I do think it's kind of a it's a it's a very thin line, I think, and it's that's a hard question to ask. I do think, but um, I would say that I don't think we should accept that as a defense. I think that if someone has to resort to that defense, then that probably means that they realize what they did was wrong. I just think that with Abraham, it's different because we can see it from a perspective, like when we read it from the Bible, we see it from a perspective that God actually did tell him to go do that. So I guess that's why it's different. So as saying that if someone truly believes, even if God did not in fact speak to them, if they truly believe that they saw God and uh, perhaps go out and suicide bomb themselves into a mass of people in the name of God and the perpetuation of uh, the Islamic religion, is that justified? Is that moral? Right. I would say that um, I don't think that is. And that's actually something I, as I was reading through this paper, I realized I didn't clarify. And I was thinking it would get brought up, but it actually didn't. And I was thinking, like, when faith is bad. And I think that faith, I would say that it's really tricky because like you said, regardless of whether or not it's true, people can have faith in it. So someone like who's like a suicide bomber or something has, they, they have faith that what they're doing is right or that they are truly doing it in the name of God. But I think that that faith is being used to commit an evil action. And I think that's where I would draw the line. So would you say that there are actions? Okay, so if God did decree that, did in fact decree that that was moral, then it would become moral? I mean, it would have, if, if, if you're believing in the Christian God that is all good, then it would have to be, then it would, not only would it be good, but it would actually be above the good if you believe what your God believes. Um, <laughs> so, you talked about how um, sometimes there are, you can find the good in irrational things. Right. Or, and so in that way, there's some truth in the irrational. Right. Um, and then you also talked about stimulation of the soul. And, yeah. and that, you know, maybe in some, in some way there, that's how you find your confidence in your faith. Mm -hmm. How do you communicate, how do you go about communicating that to others? Because right. as soon as you bring it, you can't bring the irrational truth down into some right. rational explanation. Yeah. So how do you... Uh, how do you go through to try and bring others to the truth? Mm -hmm. So what's actually interesting is Kierkegaard has a whole chapter talking about that and talking about um, because there's three problems he has with the story of Abraham and Isaac and one of them is that Abraham didn't tell anyone what he was doing and he actually says something kind of similar to what you said. He said that there's no way that Abraham could have expressed his beliefs. So I think that or expressed what he, why he was doing what he was doing. So I think that that's, and like that's also, like it's very tricky because I think that a lot of ideas about faith can be used by evil people to do evil things. Like, and that's related to what Mr. Drew asked as well. And so I, I'm just, I'm not sure. I think that I would say that it might, it might even be best not to express those beliefs to others. Because if, if you can't do it sufficiently, then I don't think that there's a point in doing it. If, if you can't um, bring it down 
to the rational and the means of, or if you can't bring someone else up, uh, right? How can you be confident in, in your faith? Well, if you, aren't, if you aren't confident in your faith, then I don't think that you truly have faith. But I, I feel like the confidence in reason comes from having the logical argument behind it. So if you and and the lo- you generally arguments tend to you know are for others Art. to get to that low, right. that spot. Yeah. And so for me, a confidence in my faith would come from relation with another. Mm-hmm. And so t- to me, I don't know how you could have confidence or even have faith without the means of bringing others to that same truth. I I see what you're saying, but at the same time, I think that. I don't know if this will really answer it. Like, if it doesn't, just let me know. But I think that the way you, con- like, in my paper, like, like, I was reading Kierkegaard, I realized that I agree with him in a lot of things. And I think that the way he describes the journey of faith is very compelling, and it it doesn't necessarily involve another. It involves you and God. And it's just, you have to acknowledge the impossibility of God, and then you have to believe in him anyways. And I think that that is... I think that trying to explain to someone reasonably why you did that is, I think, impossible because I don't think there is a, I don't think there's a reasonable reason to do that. But I still think that, so I, I basically I'm saying I still think you can come to faith without being able to tell others. And I don't think that you can necessarily bring others up to a being above the universal, but I think that God can. How are you defining slavery? Sorry, I keep coming back to this idea. <laughs> right. Um, just like, how am I defining it? I yeah, just think just that so. being enslaved to something means that you sacrifice some level of freedom in order to... You sacrifice some level of freedom because you are you have to obey that thing or you have to do what that thing says. So... Is it not necessarily against someone's will? Yeah, that's kind of one of the ideas that I talked about in here too, was like, um, are you talking, I just want to clarify, when you say it's not necessarily against someone's will, does that mean like, are you saying that someone can choose to go into slavery? Yeah. Yeah, I think that they can, which is an idea that I struggled with, but then I kind of struggled with it less when we start talking about being enslaved to the good, because I think that that makes sense to choose to be enslaved to the good. I'm just confused. If I have knowledge of what's good, how am I necessarily enslaved to it? Because I can, I can buy that you can choose to almost be in ignorance, mm. but I don't know if I can buy that like that you can choose to be enslaved to something that's beneficial towards you. Well, I think that. I mean, I think that with being enslaved to the good, I mean, that's a quote from Romans. Like, mm-hmm. he, Paul talks about being like enslaved to Jesus, kind of, and being enslaved to the good. So I think that that idea, it's not that you're physically, it's not like you're in chains or anything like that. It's not like physical slavery. It's more like, I think being enslaved to the good means that you're always thinking about what's good and you're always trying to do what's good. But then that sounds like knowingly and willingly, which then sounds like a, I don't know, which then sounds like a choice, which I think if you make choices, you're free. I, I don't know. It's just confusing to me. Is there, sorry if this is not right. <laughs> is there a connection between limiting your own freedoms voluntarily for the joy it brings you and love? Yeah, I guess I could see that. Like, but what? So you're saying that in some ways love is like an enslavement? That seems like. So yeah, it, I'm saying maybe love is a better word than enslavement. Yeah. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So that enslavement of good is, or the enslavement to the good could be better described as maybe love for the good. Yeah, you're you're voluntarily mm. limiting yourself, your freedoms, things you could do but you decide not to do to pursue something. Possible. Is being sensual is ever a good thing? Um, yeah, that's kind of a point we reached in the discussion, and I'm still kind of struggling with that, because if being a sensualist just means following what we enjoy, or what gives us, like, pleasure, I would say that everyone, except for, like, masochists, are sensualists, um, so then it's like, so I wouldn't say that a masochist is better than me, so I would say that I think being a sensualist can be good, because I mean, I guess, like, I would say that someone who loves God, or loves loving God, as I said in my paper, I would say that someone like that is a sensualist, technically, but it's, like, weird, because sensualist has this, like, negative connotation, even though it might not necessarily be a bad thing. So, what's the line for that? Are you saying the line is that it has to be good, but right. I feel like that's subjective? Well, I'm talking so, about the objective good, like, the true good. But how do you know if you believe in the objective good? Well, then that's the... I mean, that's the, uh, that's why I brought up happiness. That which makes you happier is going to be that which is more truly good. we got about one minute left. Typically, we save the last oh. question for a family member. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh -oh. I don't know if this is any good. <laughs> First off, your paper was awesome. Yeah. Um, so, credit to you and your advisors and mm -hmm. your students who I know uh, bring you up. So, really good stuff. Um, so this pokes on rational versus irrational. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people come to faith uh, because of a personal encounter that they had mm -hmm. with God. And you talked to it about Augustine and his experience in the garden. And uh, other examples that came to mind of like Saul his experience on the road to Damascus, right? And uh, even you know, we've been talking about um, uh, you know um, Abraham and right. his experience. So a lot of people have that experience. So how does your, I guess, how does someone's experience like that and them coming to faith? How does that fit in with your understanding with what is rational versus irrational? Then? Hmm. That's interesting, because when I talked about Augustine was a little bit less direct than someone like Abraham, because Augustine never directly talked to God, it was more like he had these signs, like he would pick up, he picked up the Bible in the garden and it had a verse that very much related to his situation, but, so I think we could say like there's still some level, some leap of faith there, but it gets a lot trickier when you get to people like Moses or Abraham who actually spoke with God directly. Because I think with those people, I would almost argue that, oh, this is going to sound really bad, but I would almost argue that less than, like, it's less that they have faith and more that they have knowledge of God's existence. Mm -hmm. Because I think that the, there's a distinction between knowledge and faith in that, as I was saying before, anything up until that leap of faith, I would say, is knowledge. And I think that if they're talking directly with God, then you could you could argue that maybe they never had a leap of faith. So then their all their interactions with God are based in knowledge. 